With the Advantec subfloor assembly, you can be sure that you're building a reputation on something stronger. And the best builders, well, they may always stand apart, but they never stand alone. So ask yourself, are you bringing your A-game? Okay, for this group of builders roundtable discussion, Sashko was very kind and they're allowing us to use what is kind of their lobby conference room to record. Uh, we were all in, in uh, Denver for the Building Science Symposium. Sashko said, we have a space. So if you hear audio problems with people in the background or manufacturing noises, this is on site. Give us a little credit. We're, we're Give us a little slack, I should say. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, provide you some content, and we took the opportunity to record here today. So thank you, Sashko, for the space and your support of the podcast. I'm Jake Bruton, and welcome to the Unbuild It podcast. Today, I'm joined by Luke Mann of Rangeline Homes, Jackson Andrews of Jackson Andrews Building and Design, and Shane Durkin from Build Patriot. Patriot High Performance. Oh, I always do that. Your Instagram is Build Patriot. No. That's why I do that. It's the only one available. Uh, and today we're going to continue and build upon last year's uh, Builder Roundtable, same cast of characters, just quick discussions about, uh, well, basically this is like, a, let's pull back the curtain and talk about what we talk about at dinner, yeah. right? Like we're just sitting around arguing over what's the best way to not lose money. <laughs> and I mean, that, it, it's fair? fair? Okay. It's, it's a joke, but that's, that's half of what we do as builders when we talk to other builders is how busy are you? Yeah. What have you screwed up lately? Yep. Uh, and today's topic is your ideal client, finding the ideal client, vetting the ideal client. What is your ideal client? Uh, and Shane and I were just talking about, we share a very common, do you have an appropriate budget for what you wanna do? And do you value what we bring to the table? Cause that's like the best opportunity for success. If you don't have enough money, you're gonna be pissed off about the amount of money we're spending the whole time. And if you think that we're yahoos and you could have hired anybody to do what we're doing, then you're not going to see any value in what our particular group brings to the table. So we're interchangeable. So there's no value in you working with us. So those two things are where we start. But I'm really interested in how you guys get to knowing whether or not that's appropriate or what your definitions of ideal clients are. Anybody want to I'll raise start. their hand and yeah. go first? Okay. I mean, we share that same betting process because full credit to you, I kind of stole your verbiage on it. Um, you know, I repeat it all the time that what I'm looking for is a client that values the product and service we offer. So is interested in building a home to a different standard than, you know, the status quo uh, is, is really, you know, keen on having good customer service and good open lines of communication. So that's the kind of product and service part uh, and has a budget that's realistic for their expectations. So do they want this architectural <clears throat> digest level of home? You know, here are some examples of homes like that that I've built, this is what they cost. You know, I can't tell you exactly what yours is gonna cost, but here's kind of a good range. You have to know what you're signing up for. Uh, if those two things are in alignment, it's probably a good qualified project. But um, I've kind of started to expand upon that. And what I, what I oftentimes search for now is just a lot of times client demeanor. Mm -hmm. um, these are such long duration relationships from the time that you meet someone to the time that you've completed their home and are into the kind of customer service warranty side of it. It can be anywhere from two to five years even. Uh, so if you don't have a really good, strong working relationship of trust and mutual respect, I don't care how much money you're making off that project. It's not worth the wear and tear yeah. it's going to put on your mental health. Um, and so what I've kind of started to do is just open up the dialogue to get a little bit more personable with a client up front. Uh, you know, we still have every part of the business discussions, but I'll even go so far as playing around to golf with them or linking up at some social function in town, because those conversations are going to be had once you're in the build process. So why not kind of have that courting process take place in advance? Mm. Um, and, you know, some of my best clients I now look to as mentors um, and I've tried to assess, hey, what is their leadership style in their own family or in their own business? How do they treat people? Are they asking strangers what their names are to address them by name? Are they saying please and thank you? Do they have respect for your time and aren't willing to call you outside of kind of certain working hours and boundaries? 
some of those things, to be honest, weigh just as much as you know, the style and architecture of the home and whether I'm getting to build, you know, to this high performance standard. It's like, is this person going to be worth investing years of my life into, mm -hmm. you know, trying to perform at my best for? Uh, and so those two kind of wickets that you hit on are still at the core of it, but now I almost try to assess the intangibles just as much. Yeah, I think I'm gonna be stealing that from you. I always talk about uh, like our business model is to not piss anybody off which is my joking way of saying like we want happy clients because they pay their bill, they hire us back, they tell a friend. I like, uh, I think of what you just said is like, I'm looking for not jerks. Like, I'm, I, because I don't want to, I mean, I wouldn't work with a jerk as a subcontractor. Why would we, why do we do that as builders totally. agree to take on clients that were like, oh, this person's going to be difficult. 100%. I mean, just even in your regular life outside of work, whether you're interacting with you know people at your children's school or in a restaurant or a grocery store like you want to be associating and dealing with personable people yeah. you know so work relationships are no exception to that particularly because they're so long duration you know yeah i mean your project could be multi-year right and why invest that negative you know time in your life with a client who's just going to be a pain in the butt mm -hmm. And it's very draining on your sleep, on your health, on your family. I mean, if they respect you enough to, you know, if you say, hey, I can't make that meeting on Friday morning, I got something with my kids or whatever, and they're like, yeah, no problem, love that, you know, and then they want to learn more about your kids or whatever, and you can tell them about your kids, and I mean, that's the type of client that you're looking for, is one that really respects you, and yeah, for us, it's the same way. It's budget and trust, value, whatever, that word is interchangeable, for sure. I think it's also important, we jumped right into this, but I think it's also important to note, like, there are a lot of new builders or, or younger builders that are going to be like, I have to take anything that comes through the door because I have to pay the bills. And I think our business wasn't successful until we started vetting clients. Like when we were like, oh, you called, you must be our client. We did tons of stuff that we didn't like, that we didn't enjoy, that we didn't make any money off of, that we didn't build lasting relationships with. And the second that we started being particular and asking questions, and even just make it seem as if the client is interviewing to work with you, we got people that cared about what we were doing to a different level and it, it changed our business. So the idea of like, oh, but I'm only two years in business and I don't, I don't have the ability to tell people no. You absolutely do and it's probably the right thing for you to do. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are plenty of people that are gonna call every day that are not your client. You shouldn't want them. Totally, that's a, sorry for interjecting, no, no, no. that's a really difficult thing to, uh, I guess hold yourself accountable to as a new starting growing business to feel like you have to effectively take on anything there is just a small little anecdote I had a project that when I was getting started I was out there you know scraping and knocking at everyone's door trying to just get that first project to get my business mm -hmm. established and going and there was a, a client that fortunately I didn't end up working for and it was one of those ones that it was like you know, sometimes there's an adage like the best projects uh, for you are the ones you don't take mm -hmm. on maybe or something along those lines. And I remember this conversation uh, I was having with him. And for one, he was trying to get me to commit to a fixed cost before structural drawings and architectural drawings were even complete. It's like, I can't even scope out what we're taking yeah. on. I'm not committing to a cost. And it was very forceful. I almost felt like he was trying to just take advantage of my yeah. Um, you know, inexperience in the industry. Uh, but he also said something along the lines of he was trying to determine how bankable I was. Like, what is the status of your financial mm -hmm. backstopping? Which to me in my mind was a red flag. Like, this guy could be a legal risk. Like, if he's trying to determine, like, how, you know, well capitalized I am. Mm -hmm. Like, that isn't necessarily something he should be concerned with, I felt at the moment. And so I kind of gracefully off ramp and just had to, you know, walk out the door with a, a tail between my legs, feeling like, you know, a sad dog. But uh, ultimately that guy went on to hire multiple builders, fire multiple builders, sue multiple builders. Uh, and at the time, you know, I felt like as a new business, like, hey, this is probably not an opportunity I should pass up. But thank goodness I did. And it's it's really, it's difficult to kind of hold yourself accountable yeah. to yeah. when you're getting started. You, when, you know what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, and you, you make, concessions right away when it's like well I got a light bill my wife is a really good read on people and so I'll actually bring my wife into the conversation when I meet a client for the first time or she'll ask questions and say 
what did you talk about? How was this? How was that? And I can let her know kind of how I'm feeling about the client and whatnot. And then she'll be like, okay, well, maybe we should go out to dinner with them. Maybe we should meet them. And so she's a very good read. I always bring her into the conversation. It's such a dynamic that, you know. We've, we've all met Kim. I think we would all agree <laughs> yeah. that yeah. she's smarter than you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's what we're getting at. <laughs> we had yeah, dinner yeah, with her last yeah, night. I know. We all went, I know. man, she should it's do true. this instead of looking. Yes, <laughs> I'd be fine. I'll stay home. What about you, Jackson? You know, I think, one, I'm, I'm really glad you, you said what you did, because I can remember being on the other side of the camera and watching, you know, videos of really respectable builders and kind of saying, like, you should increase your price or you should, you know, expect this from clients or, you know, where I felt like I can't say no. Like, my only option is to take a job. I 100% agree with you. Jobs that I haven't gotten, I've gone back and, and learned, like, I'm so glad I did not get that client. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that, and I count it as a blessing. Um, and I, I, so I would say like be encouraged. Like I think that hopefully through learn from other people's lessons and other people's pain. So that's what I would tell you all. If you're listening to this, there is a lot of wisdom in learning to say no and learning to select your clients. Um, your clients are going to be very selective in you, whether it's you're looking for someone to take advantage of possibly or looking to someone they really believe in. So they're going to be selective in this and you should be selective in, in who your clients are. Um, I think we are all now consistently have a lot of the same values we look for in clients. And, um, you know, for me, the most important one, I kind of have, you know, three, you know, there, there's kind of three uh, things I ask, you know, or we kind of go through with our clients. And um, I'm going to say them in kind of reverse order. Um, but, you know, for us, we'll kind of, you know, it's important. Like, do you respect, well, forget the order out of it, okay? Don't, I was don't, waiting don't, for you don't to turn around yeah. and reverse away from yep. us so that uh, you can say it. You know, but, but the, fir the first is, because ultimately this does, this does matter, and it really, it's whether the project is going to happen or not is budget. And there are, you know, people can build on many different budgets and different builders, you know, are, are operating on different, you know, uh, levels of builds. But for us and how our team is set up, there's, there's going to be a certain level of investment that we're looking, you know, for our clients to be willing to invest in their project and then also the process that we're doing. So the, the budget does have to line up. Um, well, that's not the, that, so I think that's for me the ultimate factor if this is going to work or not. Um, because the two, next two factors can be in line, but if budget's not, then it, does, it still doesn't work. But the next two are the most important to me. Um, and that's going to be respect. Essentially, does our client respect our process and, you know, and what we bring to the table and do they value that? And you can still get a client that might respect that, like you were saying, and is ultimately like, but just not a good fit. They could be a jerk. And the last one, and I'm very vocal about this now in the last probably two years that, you know, we've been, you know, hiring, you know, selecting clients. The last one I'm open about, I'll say, like, this is a meeting that we're trying to figure out, do we like each other? I'm really curious if I like you, you know, because um, if not, this is, this is not going to be a fun process. And like we've all said, these are not typically, you know, short projects. These are going to be, you know, we're involved, whether it's a project is done even in 12 months, we're sticking around for after that just to you know, stand behind our product. And if we don't like each other, this is going to be miserable. Like it's going to be painful. And that's one of the things we promise our clients is we're not, we're trying to make something that is very inconvenient, be convenient and fun. And that's what we're kind of trying to do. But if you don't like us and if we don't like you, this is not going to be a fun process at all. For sure. Okay. So we all have like a almost identical yeah. process or, or, or goal that we're getting to. What is the process look like you're you're bringing in your wife to be like hey can you make sure that i'm not just in love with these people because they have a ton of money and sure. want to build a really cool looking house yeah. like our our process is we don't agree to build the house right away like it's a lengthy process we sign a, a pre-construction services contract that might be eight months worth of working with the clients and over that eight months we have had people that got all the way to a home design that we we're like yeah we're pretty busy don't think we're going to be able to get to that job for you. And that's a, we have to walk away sometimes. We, we have the ability to learn that. We're locked in for the pre-con process. Mm -hmm. I guess we could get angry and quit during that, but that would probably leave some exposure. Uh, but we, we don't agree to build the house right away because we don't know you. Yeah. So it's a big, long dating process to get to a marriage. Exactly. What, what is your what do your processes look like to get to the point where you figure out that this is, they do check all the boxes? I mean, you said social situations, right? Mm -hmm. So it's time. I think, um, you know, I've got the benefit of I live in a small town that's a really tight knit community. And so chances are I know friends of yeah. these potential mm -hmm. clients, like their reputation is kind of already out for public, you know, 
assessment, so to speak. Uh, so if a client comes to me, you know, oftentimes too, I have a really strong w relationship of trust with the architects that I work with in my town. And so they've also kind of run their own vetting process. Mm -hmm they've made it through somewhat of a filter before they've got to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also have a, a pretty easy way of kind of, you know, reaching out into my network to see if I know any friends of theirs or, you know, mutual colleagues or something like that. But I think a lot of that dating process, I try to, I, I would hope that I wouldn't have to gracefully off ramp in a pre-construction services agreements, but you can never be 100% certain about, you know, a feeling you have, um, all completely up front, but I think a lot of that dating process for me happens in this initial, um, like what all, what I tend to do is when a client reaches out is to just take them on job site tours, mm -hmm. you know, get a feel for all of those things you talked about, their budget, you know, whether they value the product and service. And usually by that point, after spending a couple weeks of getting to know them and understanding their, their values and their vision, I've got a enough data points that I can assess, hey, I think this is going to be a good fit and we'll enter into a pre-construction services agreement. And, you know, fortunately for me, all of those have converted. I haven't yet had to yeah. off ramp. And I've always thought that if I did too, you know, this is maybe piggybacking on this topic. That's a scary process if you ever had to do that. Like cutting ties completely from a project can leave a client exposed. And the last thing you want is for them to react negatively to that mm -hmm. and then try to kind of claw back some level of recourse. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, I have not had to do that, but I've always thought the language around it would be something like, hey, this is you know not a good fit for us for X, Y, and Z reasons. I'd like to gracefully off ramp from this project, but I want to kind of continue helping you build momentum until we find the right point at which someone else can take a handoff from me. Because the last thing I want is for someone to say, well, you know, we've already demoed the house to do some pre-construction site surveys. And now I've got all these liquidated damages. My property's worth a different amount. And you've put me in this situation and now you're taking a step away from yeah. me. So, you know, like I said, fortunately it hasn't come to that um, because I, I think I'm trying to front load that vetting process in advance of the pre-construction services agreements. But in my thought, and maybe you can speak to this too, Jake, is like when it comes to that time, like is there an appropriate way to deal with, is there an appropriate communication strategy around that? Yeah. It certainly shouldn't be a surprise. Like, yeah, like, like, yeah, you, yeah. Right. Shouldn't it be like a mutual thing where you're both kind of for sure, for sure. For sure. It'd be ideal if it is. Or sometimes yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, ideal yeah. is. Ideal is everyone's like, yeah, we should like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great breakup, see. right? Yeah, it's both of us, you know? Um, <laughs> but how often does that happen? I think that uh, similar to you, Shane, I, for us, like committing to a pre-con agreement is a big deal for us. Like we're not, like I have no intention of going to pre-con unless we're really 100% planning on building this project. Um, and even our clients are also committing to that. When someone goes into pre-con, we're establishing how long we think pre-con is going to be and when they expect to start. And we're kind of at that point locking in a project manager down the road and our clients understand the investment they're making. So I'm very hesitant. Like we put a lot of time of just kind of discussing up front before going into pre-con because am I like, thankfully we haven't had a job go into pre-con that has not gone to contract. Um, so I'd, it's much easier for us to kind of, you know, get to know each other and figure out early on before any level of investment's been made. Um, that like we, a pre-pre-con? Yeah, we do a pre-pre and then another pre-pre-pre-pre-con. Um, well, I've always said like that first interview <laughs> process is like dating. Your pre-con's like engagement and then the construction mm -hmm. contract yeah. is like a marriage. Yeah, so there is that dating process where you are trying to feel each other right. out right. a little bit with dinners and things like right. that. But, right. And references are great. Like uh, you saying this too, yeah. like it, for us, most of our clients, they are, it's rare that I'm getting someone that doesn't know us that's coming to us. Um, most of them know a past client or we know a mutual friend or yeah. there's some connection. And that's one of the first questions I ask. I say, hey, thanks so much for calling. Like, how'd you hear about us? Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I want to know the connection right up front um, because at that point, that's probably somewhere I'll go back to and circle around. Sure. And thankfully, if it's a past client, it's great because I'm, I'm, and my first thought is like, we get along great with our clients. I can call mm -hmm. them and be like, hey, tell me the deal on this. And I've had clients be very up like, hey, they're great. Be careful. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. just be mindful of this, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. and it's like, that's all I needed to hear. And I, it's all I to make that decision of like, and there's some clients that are, I, again, our clients have become very close, you know, friends of ours and, and we're, and we were tied to them. So I value their input. And I, I also feel like they, 
they don't want to be tied to something that could be a headache because they've learned our process, understand how invested we are, and they've enjoyed that. So they, I think they also become a vetting you know, ground for us. I have had clients pull out of the pre-construction agreement, like as we go to price the project. Oh, They're right, surprised yeah. by the price or yeah. whatever it is. And so um, it's been two in the last, I don't know, year or two. Yeah. We price it. They're surprised. They're like, God, I can get this for a lot cheaper. So we pull out of the pre-construction mm -hmm. agreement, and I'm like, well, Good luck, because That's the other guy's going to be almost yeah. exactly yeah. the same, yeah. and it's something that just happened, but I mean, yeah. So we had, uh, um, I took one of my project managers with me to look at a renovation project. The house is new. Mm -hmm. The builder did not completely finish. He got him close enough to get him occupancy. Uh, I didn't, I asked, but they kind of beat around the bush as to why the builder was no longer involved. So there's like this, you know, we have a little bit of a red flag, but it could be anything. There are a lot of people in our industry that are jerks. Yeah. Like it could be not, not their fault in any way. And so that initial meeting, we're walking the property and just kind of, they're just kind of listing things off that they're unhappy with. And I'm asking all these questions about, well, how did this get to this point? How did this get to this point? And I kept seeing uh, my project manager is like, he's listening, but he's looking at me trying to figure out why I'm asking specific questions. And we, they seem like perfectly nice people. They, it does feel as the way they tell it, obviously there's two sides to every story. It does feel as if this is not their fault mm -hmm. and that they're in a tough situation. And it's one of those things where as the builder, we know we can resolve these issues where it's like, ah, we, you know, we could help these people. Mm -hmm. We get in the truck and before my project manager and I talk at all, I, he's getting in the truck and the phone's, I'm making a phone call and I'm like, hey, uh, you're this builder's salesman, right? And I called the guy at the lumber yard that I know is that builder's salesman and I said, can you tell me about this project? And the first words out of his mouth are, you do not want to be involved with those people. Mm -hmm. And so that small town, yeah. it's like they, they seem like we could really help them. Mm -hmm. They see the value in what we're bringing there mm -hmm. and they probably have an appropriate budget. Mm -hmm. And that that network, that small community, that, <clears throat> I mean, you guys are all kind of, you work in one neighborhood, kind of. You work in a really small town. You work in a really small town, in essence. Like, we I all work in multiple neighborhoods, are blessed. <laughs> <laughs> We're all blessed with, we have connections where we can make phone calls and we can figure things out before saying yes or no. And 15 years ago, I would have never thought to call a salesman, I would have just been like, I can help these people yeah. and yeah. been yeah. like excited to help these people. Mm -hmm. But, in, and, and I don't know if he's right or not, but I, I know that I trust him enough to go, yeah, we'll probably keep it at arm's length for now, mm -hmm. yeah. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's learning to say no and learning to not have every client be your client, I think is like the most important thing that I ever did for my business. Do we have, uh do we divulge or do we share? Are there any red flags that we, uh, as contractors, that come across that we are like, oh, that's a, that's a red flag, something we might want to be mindful of? I feel like every time a client comes to the first meeting with, I know exactly how much this house is going to cost, and if you tell me anything different, you're wrong. Yeah. Like when the client's like, no, I know that this is a $500,000 house. Well, I can tell you that one of us prices things every day, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the one that does that yeah. does not think it's a $500,000 house based off of what you described by an order of magnitude. Like yeah. it's, you just described a $2 million house. Well, my sister-in-law built one for, <laughs> like that's the first one that I'm just like, oh, this is gonna be difficult because they've already made up their mind. And if they've already made up their mind, that's a really difficult thing to change. Yeah. Or they have relatives who are in the industry that they would like to help participate in the build or something. That, that's another thing. that one yeah. can be can tough. Be. We've yeah. built our team based around, and I think we're gonna talk about subcontractors. Yeah, we talked about yeah. how to handle that but situation. I think we've, I, I always say like, you know, we've built our team based around what can deliver the product that we, that we, that you deserve. Uh, we're open to those discussions, but that's a tough one. Yeah. My dad used to be an electrician or my dad was an electrical engineer. He's going to do our HVAC where it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> the, my dad used to be a farmer. He's going to roof the house. Do you have red flags that you look for, Shane? Um, yeah, I'm trying to define them. You know, I'm, I'm, I try to make a, you know, vow to my clients that I will conduct myself with as high level of personal accountability as I can. And I'm always looking for personal accountability on the client side too, mm -hmm. because, 
you know, I'm, I don't fully subscribe to that, ad, that adage that customer is always right. I do think that there are customers instances, rarely right. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> is that actually what's, um, you know, and, and, and the process of building a custom home is completely collaborative and I can't do my job right unless I've got, you know, the right amount of inputs from them. They have, you know, just as much accountability in the budget and schedule as I do, if not more. Um, and so I'm, because that can be such a contentious issue that I'm trying to assess whether they conduct, whether they carry themselves with a, a level of personal accountability in their lives. Cause I feel like that could be very difficult if not, you know. Yeah. yeah. What about you? I think mine are probably not so heavy, but they're more like it's, you know, my girlfriend just built a house, so I'm going to have her help with, you know, she has a good eye, you know, and, and knows some of this mm -hmm. stuff. Or, mm -hmm. And so there, there's things that, like, I say red flags for me might be like, oh, th these are things we should probably address and, like, talk through in that beginning stage of, like, hey, that's great, like, that you know someone that built a house before and that you trust their design instinct. Like, do you have a designer, you know, um, and, and kind of, like, we'll steer it back to the importance of having people in place that might, might help with certain tasks. That's or, actually a huge you know, one for me. Yeah. Like, are you going to hire mm -hmm. an interior designer or not? Yeah. If you think it, that you're going to go without it, huge red flag. Right. Like, we're not a good fit. Or at least it, it would take the time. Like, I'm sure you do. It's like, hey, let's talk about why we see the value in that. Mm -hmm. But if someone then kind of maybe strong, you know, holds strong to like, no, I, another one I hear frequently. And, and I've learned to kind of, again, address these. And let's, I can kind of go through with some humor, hopefully. But if a client's like, oh, I'm really good at making decisions. Oh, great. Okay. Like, well, there are a lot of decisions we're going to have to make. And mm -hmm. it could feel overwhelming at times. But it's like, nope, I'm making really fast. And it's like. Kind of like, hey, you might, but don't get disappointed. I'm going to plan on you not making them fast kind of a thing. Because if I plan on you making them quickly and then you take forever, then this does kind of become a, a, a little bit of a, some rub. Have you ever had anybody say, I'm really good at, at making decisions, like timely, quick decisions, and then actually deliver on that? I had one, one woman <laughs> who you, you, you've, you've messed with. She, she's one of my, uh, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. They have no idea how many decisions they're going to need to make. No, they don't. But again, because they don't do this every day, yeah. you know. And, and so um, I think it's, you know, I, I look at the red flags as a great chance for us to like, all right, let's kind of educate in this moment and yeah. see see the type of reaction you get. So it's like it's not even a red flag. It's like an opportunity to jump yeah. over that conversation. Yeah. And if they're willing to have you lead that conversation yeah. past that red flag that you thought might have been, yeah, you know, if they're willing to at least be like, well, I'm quick at making decisions, and then you can explain to them. Well, here's how we, you know, and then if they're like, okay, yeah, fine. All right, I get it. Let you lead again. There's four walls in each room, and you're probably not going to paint all the walls of the exact same color. Yeah. And there are 15 rooms in this house, and what are we going to do? For you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so I didn't realize that we were all going to be so on the same page for why this topic. You, why do you think we're all on the same page, though? Because we've all been burned in the same ways. Yeah, and, we, and we've, been, we've been, like... Collab, you know, I feel like we've kind of behind the scenes been learning from each other for mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. over a year now. You know, so it's kind of neat to see, like, I'm not too surprised that we're we're doing a lot yeah, of similar things we now. Agree on a lot yeah. Of yeah <laughs> that. Uh, so, are we going to just say like the opportunity for for success is the the client vetting process? Is like that's half of whether or not the job is going to be successful. Yeah, I think that's that, that's your that's your that's your hundred you know right at the, that's your first obstacle mm -hmm. in the front of like. You know, is this, yeah, mm -hmm. is this right? Mm -hmm. 100%. Mm -hmm. Good client fit is, I think, probably the most sensitive variable to determining business success. Like, if you have a portfolio of business where you don't have good builder client fit, that will translate to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So if you can ensure good kind of client fit and cohesion, you're probably going to be a more efficient company and more profitable. There you go. We're going to leave it with that. Uh, thanks for watching the Unbuild It podcast today. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and uh, subscribe on any of your platforms where you download your podcast. These gentlemen are joining me for a few more Builder Roundtables to publish in successive weeks or maybe before this. We don't know which one this is. Uh, but, gentlemen, thank you. Until next time, have a good day. <laughs>